So, today's title of the lecture is uh, Environmental Reforms. Environmental Reforms. So how do we reform the environment? So we've had a lot of, so the readings today are all going to be talking about different um, uh, uh, ways of reforming the, the environmental policy that we have. And I'm not going to be getting into the details of the readings as usual, but I will go over broadly some related topics. And let's start with talking about David Suzuki again. And David Suzuki was the, uh, everybody knows him as the environmental scientist who um, has a CBC show, The Nature of Things, and he's very pr uh, a prominent figure internationally when it comes to the issues of the environment. And he had a video, a short video that I linked to earlier in the semester, where he was talking about how economics is brain damage, is a form of brain damage. Those were his words. And his example was he had a test tube and he said, if we fill this test tube with bacteria and food, and the bacteria were doubling, um, uh, they had, they were doubling at some rate. At what point in time would they notice that there's a problem? And he said, the scientists would say, when the uh, test tube was half full, then they would say, uh, look, we are running out of time. We need to do something. And he, and he said, oh, the, the economists, they would say, oh, don't worry, We're, we still have half a test tube left. And uh, we, we don't need to worry, but you know that in the next hour, it's going to, the population of the bacteria is going to double and they're going to fill out of their, uh, of, they're going to run out of room. So he said, even if we, the best scientists spent all the money and, and knowledge in the world to create two more test tubes, that's going to run out in another hour. So, he said, this is a problem of not economics, but of science. And so we need to reform, uh, we need to reform the, the economy to be around science, to, to value the input of natural scientists and biologists, because, uh, only biologists understand exponential growth. Only biologists understand that we have limited resources and, uh, we're going to run out of them. So let me ask the chat. How many of you guys actually watched that David Suzuki video? Did you all watch that video? Oh, for another class. Interesting. So, Mish um, For those of you who have seen it, where have you seen it before? In what context? How did, uh, how did you guys discuss it? Was it in a positive manner that, that David Suzuki is right? Or was it uh, uh, in a negative manner that he was wrong? Or maybe neutral? High school bio population dynamics, environmental science class back in college, and that he was more or less right. Okay, so I think that's I think that's about the consensus view among non-economists that David Suzuki makes a lot of sense. Is that we have only so much stuff and we're gonna run out. I hope by this point of the semester, you guys have uh, realized that um, we have opportunities of reorganizing society, not through listening to wise science bureaucrats, but through just taking part of uh, taking part in the price system. And if you are running out of resources, what does that mean? Let's just draw our supply and demand graph. What would it mean? We have got price, we've got quantity, we've got supply, we've got demand. What would it mean if you're running out of resources? It would, you could draw this several ways. One way would be that your supply curve is shifting inward. So it's going to be not only shifting inward, but it's also going to get more vertical as well. So this might be your original supply curve. The new supply curve might look like this. 
But just because the supply curve is shifting inward and it's becoming more inelastic, does that mean that everyone's just going to sit there and accept it? Well, no, because our behavior is going to change. We're not only going to be consuming fewer quantities, but we're also going to be paying a higher price. The price is going to go up and we're going to be consuming less stuff. So that's part of the story about how prices can just uh, get us to use less things as they're running out. It, we can do better though. We know that as, as the price for something is going up, that's creating incentives for, uh, for entrepreneurs to come in and try to innovate new ways to meet this missing demand. Okay, So that's another way that entrepreneurship economics with a free market that can alleviate shortages or missing, uh, uh, missing supply, we can get in there and we can create new things. Look at right, right now what's happening with masks. There's a big uh, lack of masks. We know that we need more masks. So a lot of companies are stopping what they were doing before and making masks. There was a, a company in Japan, I think, or South Korea. They used to be making swimsuit, um, swimsuits and swimwear. And they're now repurposing their, uh, their materials to stop making swimwear and start making masks. So you'll see like a bikini looking mask, but... It, it does the job, right? It's cloth mask, and that's the new uh, that's the new medical recommendations to wear any sort of cloth mask as better than nothing to deal with uh, the coronavirus. We don't even have to stop there. So we can also talk about how um, in a lot of markets, let's talk about another environmental issue, and that is the issue of uh, of of endangered species, right? So tigers, we say, are endangered. But if anyone's been watching the uh, the, the new show on Netflix, uh, Tiger King, you're aware that they start off the program by saying that there are more tigers captured, uh, living in captivity in the United States than they are living in the wild. And when we have, uh, and we, and why is that? It's because there's a market to buy and sell tigers in the United States. And activists are upset about this, that they're not living uh, freely, etc. But that's not the real alternative that those tigers had. The real alternative is that they are, uh, their habitats are being destroyed as we speak, and their populations are dwindling as a result. So the first issue is let's just save the population, let's increase the population, and then we can talk about uh, increasing their habitats and making better habitats and um, having people donate to buy off conservations and other reserves etc the tiger isn't the only uh, animal that's been brought back from uh, from endangerments through uh, markets elephants in zimbabwe also used to be um, uh, endangered until they started privatizing elephants they allowed people to own elephants and so reserves were developed for um, for raising elephants for the use of hunting and they the hunters would pay a lot of money to come in for the opportunity to shoot an elephant but it would also give incentives to the 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 owners of the of the reserves to breed elephants so that their populations are increasing in order to um, uh, attract not just hunters by the way other people just looking to shoot animals with a camera right it's not the only way with a gun isn't the only way of shooting something you can also also shoot with a camera you can also attract tourists with the with with the who wants to take pictures want to pet these animals, etc. And a lot of people now want a natural looking environment. They don't want to see an animal chained up uh, at in front of some store or zoo in, in Thailand. They like to see them in their natural environment. So this creates an op so by allowing people to own these animals, privatizing them, uh, you can get um, you can get these populations to be increasing. And then once the population is increasing, you save them from the brink of extinction. Then we can talk about other ways of expanding their natural habitat. I see a lot of activity in the chat. Let's see what's happening there. So GM is now making ventilators. That's true. There's a Guelph-based company doing the same thing, but instead of manufacturing hoses, they're manufacturing ventilator tubes. Excellent. Uh, my brother is a doctor in the U.S., and they need these masks before 
something CDC recommended by free market didn't bother with. Well, my understanding is, what do you mean by before? So my understanding is that uh, there was a lot of these masks available for very cheap. So the the, the official mask that um, uh, medical professionals need is something called the N95 uh, respirator. And an N95 means that it stops 95% of particulate matter from going in. Um, and it's a respirator because it's uh, it has a vacuum seal around your mouth. It's not just a surgical mask, which has which is empty. It's got a vacuum seal. And those used to be so cheap, you can go down to, and so available, you can go down to Home Depot and uh, you would buy them if you were just painting your house, right? And, or doing a lot of work with dust. They were plenty available. It was only in the last two or three months when we've had uh, a lot of rise in demand that we've seen demand for these masks increase. And we just didn't have the factory capacity to meet the demand the newfound demand. Um, there was news today about 3M, one of the big manufacturers of these masks. Um, they have their huge global manufacturer. They make all sorts of things. They also make um, the uh, the the automated payment machines. Um, when you go to like tap your card, they make all sorts of random things. They also make these uh, respirators, and they were recently ordered by the United States government in order to not sell to Canada and Latin America, in order to prioritize um, FEMA employees and federal government employees uh, in the United States. And they're actually pushing back. 3M is pushing back against this, uh, against this order. It's a direct order um, through a law called the Defense Productions Act. And they're, they publicly put out an announcement. They said, look, these other countries don't have the, the built-in infrastructure to make their own uh, respirators. So we need to provide this for them until they build up uh, some capacity. So the market takes time and we just don't have enough. So even right now with the governments trying to mandate certain companies to make things, we're still there. In, at the end of the day, they're picking and choosing who's going to get some and who isn't in an arbitrary political manner, as opposed to a who's willing to spend the most money on, uh, on accumulating these masks. So, the private healthcare system in America has absurd priorities. Uh, it's the the healthcare system in America is messed up in a lot of ways, but to characterize it as a free market system, I think is uh, grossly mistaken. There are so many rules and regulations in place, with especially with the incentives regarding um, uh, insurance getting in the in, getting in the getting in between buyer and seller, that there's been a rise in recent years of doctors in the United States that don't even, that say we will take patients, uh, but we will not accept insurance payments. Okay. So if you have insurance, they, they're cash only business. They say we will not take any sort of payments uh, with, with through insurance. We don't want to deal with those guys. There's too much red tape and headache to deal with them getting paid, etc. So we are cash only and they are offering services at one tenth or even less at the price that you would get at a hospital. And and I say price very loosely because in a lot of these hospitals and other medical places, if you call them up and you say, I have a medical issue, how much is it going to cost? They, have, they will have no idea. They will have no idea what the cost will be because it's such a messed up system that who pays, who ends up paying uh, is a convoluted system because of uh, all sorts of rules and regulations in place that make things confused. So let's let's ignore the healthcare system. Let's bring it back to the environment. So with the environment, we had uh, we have people responding to prices, entrepreneurs responding to prices, regulations um, uh, regarding owning environmental property being very important. Um, there was. I mentioned this in another class about uh, this bet between Paul Ehrlich and, uh, well, it was a, an, an, an ecologist and an economist. They made a bet regarding uh, a basket of commodities. And the issue was, uh, we're going to run out of these commodities. And the economist said, well, if we're going to run out of these economies, we should, uh, commodities, we should expect the prices to go up. And so they made a bet. I think it was 10 years, 
long and at, at, at the end of the 10 years they saw the prices of those uh, goods and they had actually gone down in inflation adjusted terms in another way um, uh, environmental problems are asked to be reformed right now is through something called the carbon tax and you guys had a debate on the carbon tax and the carbon tax is they're saying so you got price you got quantity you got a supply and demand the carbon tax is the belief that the equilibrium market price is too low is too low because of externalities because of other market failures and to touch back i said that market failures exist there's no doubt the markets fail all the time uh, but the issue is how do you address them it's not so obvious how you address them and one way people address the market failure of pollution and they say oh we have too much pollution because they'll, they'll even say uh, the best ones will say we've got too much market pollution because we're actually subsidizing um, these big companies to pollute uh, by taking away property rights from others. Um, there was a famous, um, there's a quote from a famous uh, oil exec, and he said, it was a Canadian guy, and he said, if Alberta was actually enforcing property rights, we would actually have to shut down most of the oil production in Alberta. So property rights are serious, and they could, they can be very restrictive. So a lot of people will say, well, we have two, we're not enforcing property rights effectively. So let's come back with, uh, with, with a, um, with a carbon tax. And what a carbon tax says is that you have the supply and demand curve. That's this private supply and demand, but we have the societal demand curve. That's much bigger, but we're not enforcing the supply societal demand. This is a D. This should be the price. I'm going to put a P with a little halo above it and angel wings. So this is, this is the price we should have seen, but we don't see because of these subsidies, etc. And, you know, other market failures. So market failures allow us to get to this PF for the price that we get at market failure rates, which is too low. So we need a higher price and to get the higher price, you, inc you include taxes. So they say, let's tax uh, carbon in order to get this higher price. So before I give my take on the carbon tax, uh, do you guys see any shortcomings with this approach at all? So waiting for opinions on any potential shortcomings on the carbon tax, as I've drawn it out here. The demand is inelastic is one suggestion, maybe. Any others? Discriminate against poor individuals. That's, uh, people talk about regressive taxes that means that they tax proportionately more heavily on the poor than uh, than the high income people. And that's something um, that's brought up actually about carbon taxes, but that's not even the problem that I'm going to be focusing on. Let's see. Hard to calculate the price. What do you mean hard to calculate the price? Do we have an answer? Why is it hard to calculate the price? We don't know at what price behavior of individuals will change. Environment is unpredictable and the effects of carbon into the future are complex. So this is a good, so two things I'd like to get into. First of all, we have no idea what this real demand curve would look like. We have no idea what this real demand curve would look like. And so setting the price uh, at that place where this imaginary demand curve would be is virtually impossible. 
So we've got people winning Nobel Prizes now, um, trying to estimate this, but this is still an estimate. We, we, we're not, we don't know for sure. Another issue is trying to determine something called the social cost of carbon. The social cost of carbon. The social cost of carbon is the, the idea that what, what, what carbon is going to cost for society as a whole. Okay. How much is it going to cost in terms of lives, in terms of property damage, in terms of, um, uh, the animal welfare that we're losing and people have all sorts of estimates for the social cost of carbon and they, the SCC, and they do this, uh, they, they extend it over time. And when you're trying to project or estimate something that happens over time, what you have to do is you have to take into account the interest rate. What would you have done with the money otherwise? And the interest rates that you use for calculating the social cost of carbon uh, can be very uh, influential. If you have a 2% inf- interest rate, the social cost would be much higher than if you had a 5% interest rate. And there is there was a study done a couple of years ago, more than a couple of years ago, in the United States, uh, where the where the federal government required in the United States that uh, that the estimate be done using uh, interest rates at two percent, at five percent, I think at like one percent as well, and then also at seven percent. And the study actually did all the three or three lower uh, interest rate uh, estimates, but they did not do the seven percent interest rate estimates. And the one person actually crunched the numbers and he said, if we did it at the 7% interest rate, it's possible that the social cost of carbon would actually be negative. It would be negative. That means a negative cost to carbon, which means it's a benefit, which means that the cost of carbon would actually out or be outweighed by the benefits. What are the benefits of carbon? Well, for example, if it's true that uh, the more carbon in the atmosphere, we get more warming. It's also true that we get more, um, uh, arable land, farmable land in the northern latitudes, and that would allow more uh, farming to take place. It's also true that more people die a lot around the world because of cold weather than they do in warm weather. I think it's something like five times as many people die, maybe ten times as many people die because of um, uh, the weather's too cold as opposed to it being too warm. And so if uh, if carbon in the atmosphere causes warming, then the more warming there is, uh, the uh, the fewer people will die because of the cold. That's another example. There's also a third reason not related to the environment at all. And the third reason is that as the, as the economy progresses, as everybody gets richer, it's it becomes less of a burden in, to future generations to pay uh, to pay out of their income to mitigate climate change later than it would be from us now. So you can think of it this way. Would you, uh, if you were, a, does it make more sense to have a baby save money from infancy in order to buy a beer when it's 18? Or would it make more sense uh, for an 18 year old to just save their own money over the course of an hour in order to, uh, uh, to buy their own beer. The 18 year old is going to be much richer than an infant or a baby or a toddler. And so toddlers make pennies, uh, a, an hour and a, uh, an 18 year old can make, uh, 10, 15, $20 an hour. Right? So you have to take into account the fact that incomes are going to be much higher in the future as we get more capital accumulation, as we get, um, better, uh, more efficient ways of, uh, of organizing the economy through entrepreneurship, uh, that it will be cheaper for future generations to deal with the problem uh, in the future than it would be right now. And that would that goes into the cost, the social cost of carbon uh, calculations as well. So let's see what's happening with the chat. So climate change isn't just warming. It's true. The climate it's climate destruction and increased desertification. So the deserve, the, that's, that's taken account of in the social cost of carbon, uh, 
situation. So there's more desertification, but there's also more arable land. And the question is, is there more desertification or more uh, arable land availability? And that goes into the calculations. Uh, increased equatorial drought and desertification would probably reduce global agriculture overall. So those are real estimates that people take into account and they say it's possible it could go one way or the other. Um, but does not warm weather promote diseases like malaria and Zika, causing way more deaths? It, it may do so, but it may also uh, allow more people to be alive. And as we're going to be getting richer, we'll have more access to medicines to deal with these diseases as well. If you notice, for most diseases, they start, uh, or the places that have the most problem with diseases are, tend to be places that have very low incomes. Um, this is another issue that you have to be aware of, that as we get richer, we get more access to medicines that, that weren't available even 100 years ago, even uh, let alone 200 years ago, 500 years ago, when we were poorer but living in different climates. Uh, it will cost exponentially more to deal with it later, though. That's right, but we'll also be ex exponentially richer. So it's, it's not clear which way, whether the cost will outweigh the benefits. And people, this is what the social cost of carbon calculations are about. Substantial land and infrastructure loss, yes, due to flooding and storms. We got, again, people still die because of the cold and other uh, reasons right now. Another way you can think about it is, uh, how do we know that the current status quo or the status quo in terms of the weather a hundred years ago was the optimal weather, right? So we've talked about optimality all the time. How do we know that the opt what the optimal rate of weather should be? We do have uh, rec weather records going back uh, millennia, really, but we also know that weather has constantly changed. We know that uh, uh, the weather during the dinosaur times was not the same as during what it is now. So we can have stable weather at different, or stable climates at different temperatures, uh, different uh different climate patterns, etc., And we can get lots of life flourishing. The issue is the transition periods. And how do we deal with the transitions? Would it be easier to deal with the transitions as we get richer into the future? Or should we deal with them now? And that's not an obvious question from an economic point of view. The amount most poor countries around the world... Uh, aren't most poor countries... Uh, around the world near the equator, uh, where it's warmer, and the majority of rich countries in the northern hemisphere. Maybe the majority is true, but think of the richest countries in the world in terms of uh, GDP per capita, and those are Hong Kong, Singapore, um, uh, the UAE, and Luxembourg. So Luxembourg is in the north, but Hong Kong, Singapore, and the UAE are very, very warm climates. So they you, just because you're in a warm climate does not doom you to a life of poverty. And um, Australia is also uh, relatively uh, closer to the equator than Canada is, and they're just as rich as us. Uh, so being close to the equator is not, a, is not a death sentence for poverty. And Russia, as we know, is very, very north, and they are relatively poor. So just... Being north of the equator does not uh, uh, guarantee being rich either. It's about the institutions you have in place. It's about how much private property is protected. It's about how uh, how robust your markets are and how people are allowed to respond to price incentives. And those are policy decisions. Those are not nature-given uh, uh, sentences of death or life. So what about instead of comparing... Dying from a heat versus dying from cold. Dying from cold versus dying from famine because of crop loss. So this has been a long established um, uh, observation that in capitalistic countries, there has never been a famine. In capitalistic countries, there's never been a famine. It's because people are allowed to respond to prices. And so uh, when there is a blight in one country, in one capitalist country, then people can 
call in, first of all, not just the prices, but also they have access to global trade. So they can bring in supplies from around the world at slightly higher prices, but they will have the ability to do so because they have the capitalistic, they have the infrastructure in place because of the history of capitalism in those countries. In, in countries like Ethiopia and in other African countries that had horrible droughts, at least in the 1980s and 70s, there was a lot of uh, you'd be surprised the government interference that actually prevented people from getting access to food. Uh, I'll post links in those uh, to, to those histories in the description for the YouTube videos. But it was you'd be shocked how many uh, uh, regulations were in place that prevented people from getting access to food and food markets. Um, let's move on. I find it hard to understand how we could possibly end up in a theoretical profitable situation by allowing global warming to ensure uh, to ensue when all we do is create maximum possible uncertainty as we deviate farther from all of earth's norms so there's always uncertainty in the future the future by definition is uncertain if you knew what the future would be you wouldn't have any reason to choose so the fact that you have choices it implies that there's uncertainty in the future. You have no idea what's going to happen. We do have some models and we do have some predictions about what is going to happen to um, sea levels, etc. But people have been pre making those predictions for many decades. In the 1980s, there was a famous article that said that uh, by the year 2000, um, England would have uh, uh, no more winters. There's a famous... Um, uh, glacier in, in, in Alberta or, uh, in Yellowstone, sorry, in Yellowstone National Park. There was a sign there for many decades that said by 2020, uh, or by 2018, some, sometime like the last year or two, uh, uh, this glacier would have completely melted, but it's, it's still there. So even in the environmental models, clearly there's a lot of uncertainty. And the question is, how do we weigh the uncertainty of the environmental models versus the uncertainty from everyday life? And that's why we allow prices. And it's, it, it should just be interesting to note that if people really believed that sea levels were going to rise, they wouldn't, people wouldn't be buying beachfront property, right? We would, we would be seeing the price of beachfront property plummet if people genuinely believed that uh, the sea levels were going to rise in the next few years. If you, if you were an activist, for example, Al Gore, most famous, uh, one of the most famous uh, environmental act activists, he, when he made his uh, movie and won the Nobel Prize for his, uh, for his uh, documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, he talked about the uh, sea levels rising. He also bought a beachfront property in Florida. This, this kind of, uh, the talk and the actions, they don't line up. And you, you gotta ask questions. You gotta, you gotta understand why are, uh, why is the tone of the of the threats? Uh, why are they different from what the actions of the activists themselves are uh, doing? Why is Al Gore buying beachfront property when he thinks that uh, in Florida, when he thinks Florida is going to be underwater? So that's an interesting just way of thinking about things. So. Got a lot of activity here. Let me try to find where it starts. Okay. So capitalistic countries don't have famine because they take advantage of poor countries, cheaper labor and food production. Uh, I think I saw you, uh, Microcosmoic, I can't read that name, uh, in my food production lecture. But if you weren't there, I recommend you watch that lecture again. We talked about this issue at all, uh, all together um, regarding why labor is cheaper in some countries than others and why what the benefits are of global trade for both poor countries as well as rich countries. So uh, I don't think that's uh, an argument at all. Uh, not every capitalist country is rich. Not every capitalist country is rich, but every rich country is capitalist. And uh, when you... When we've never had a famine in a capitalist country. That's a historical fact. There have been blights in capitalist countries, but there's never been a famine. Even in the 1930s in the United States, when there was um, the so-called Dust Bowl, when lots of farmland uh, dried up, 
there were people uh, hungrier than they were, but it wasn't a famine because there was still food being produced. And at the same time, you had uh, the government policy in the United States. They were telling, um, in order to keep prices up for uh, goods like milk and other food items, they were telling farmers to destroy it. Farmers were dumping milk in the 30s as people were hungry and they were desperate and poor in order to keep prices up. That was government policy. So it's not, so government policy can get in the way of, of, pro, of, uh, of food problems and you just, you just have to be able to uh, look for it. So let's move on from that. Uh, we didn't necessarily know that something like COVID would hit and if Trump didn't dismantle the global pandemic office, they would have saved billions. Uh, maybe. So it's still not clear to me whether the current uh, global response to this uh, coronavirus pandemic is the correct or optimal one. Uh, this is a lot of governments were just doing what other governments were doing. And there's a lot of social pressure uh, about what we should do. And there was, uh, uh, honestly, a lot of bad statistics were out. If you remember, there was a, a number being touted for a long time about uh, potentially 2.2 million deaths in the United States. Well, if you look at the model of how they came up with 2.2 million deaths, they had to assume that as everyone was dying, nothing was changing. There was no behavior change despite anything. And we all were already voluntarily uh, self-quarantining by that time. So uh, just because uh, some model says something doesn't make it true. So you have to look at what the assumptions of the model were. And the assumptions for the 2.2 million deaths was that zero, zero action, zero difference. And that's not realistic. That's not economical because we know in economics that people respond to incentives. And if they see people around them are dying, they're going to avoid doing the things that they think is causing them to die. They would have to uh, uh, voluntarily quarantine. They would uh, uh, voluntarily make their own masks or buy masks, etc., create masks, build mask factories, etc. And that would be one result. And we already have lots of companies um, making masks, transitioning to making more masks. But the once again, policy is getting involved in preventing some companies from selling masks because they're not uh, FDA approved, etc., or ventilators. FDA, they're not approved F by the FDA. And then other companies who are uh, producing masks for other countries, uh, they're being told not to do so, like the, the, the United States announced today. So this is, uh, when there's a crisis, you, you can't just... Uh, see what the crisis is. You got to look at the processes leading up to the crisis and you got to look at the processes during the crisis and what, if anything, is actually preventing more goods from coming to market. So we get market failure when there is a lack of information. Because there is a lack of understanding of the effects of climate change, how do we count? So this is a good question. You get a market failure if there's asymmetric information. That's the allegation. If there's asymmetric information, but if everybody is in the same boat regarding uh, the confusion regarding the, the future, then that you can't possibly chalk that up to a market failure. Um, the ideas with, uh, with the carbon tax is that some people pretend to know what the future is going to look like, and they're trying to impose their views through government policy. And the, the issue I'm trying to pr press here is that the, the climate models have been wrong, and they can be wrong, and you have to let people respond in real time. And if you don't, you're just going to, you can end up with an overcorrection, and if you overcorrect, you will, you're going to make our generation poorer right now, but as we get poorer, we'll, uh, future generations will also be poorer, and that's going to be for sure. But, uh, but when it comes to the uncertainties about the future, uh, prices can deal with, uh, with crisis situations if they're allowed to work, if there isn't a huge lack of, uh, of, of impediments in the way that prevents people from making the goods and services uh, available that are necessary for uh, mitigating crises as opposed to more red tape and roadblocks. So, uh, 
In a free market where government doesn't enforce a shutdown of business, is this an effective response? It could be, right? So the, the idea is why aren't businesses shutting down voluntarily? What information does the government have that the businesses don't? And you got to remember, government is made up of individuals like you or me. The government of Georgia, the, the governor of Georgia, the state of Georgia, uh, uh, came out yesterday and he said he only just found out that the, the coronavirus can be transmitted by asymptomatic people um, uh, through the air. And that information has been available publicly since January. Uh, but the governor, governor, when he was making his policy decisions, he had no idea that it can be transmitted um, by asymptomatic people. So government politicians, they can be just as uninformed as the average person. And businesses have lots of incentives of, of protecting their own, uh, their own clients in order to uh, not get sued, for example, in order to get repeat customers. And uh, if you guys follow, um, uh, there's an Instagram account called BlogTO. Before, weeks before there was uh, official... Uh, mandates from the city of Toronto and the province of Ontario regarding uh, social distancing and businesses being closed for essential or non-essential purposes, etc. The TTC was already empty. The, the, the subway system and the transit system was already empty during rush hour. So people were already responding to themselves with the information that was uh, being made available to them uh, just through ordinary market processes. Uh, New York is different. People in New York have been responding differently. You can still see lots of people, even to this day, despite lockdowns and the governors uh, and, and the mayor pestering people to stay at home and threatening people with fines, etc. The the metro system in, in New York City is still packed. And they came out yesterday and said the reason uh, we're still packed, even though we're trying to run as many trains as possible, is because our own workers aren't coming into work anymore. And so what are you going to do? These kinds of uh, voluntary outcomes, uh, they can happen without someone mandating them or without someone uh, threatening uh, jail time or uh, ridiculous fines as well. Let's see. Uh, response to climate change is equivalent to the response to COVID too little too late. Future wasn't better able to deal with it than if relatively minor solutions were implemented earlier. What information did we have earlier that could have prevented this? There was lots of uh, countervailing information. So we, from China, we had the uh, official numbers that was something like a, a 3% of the hospitalized population was dying. And there were some indications that uh, they were concealing the number of people who were testing positive, as well as concealing the number of people who were actually dying. But it spread from China. If you don't like the numbers from China, it spread from China to uh, Hong Kong, uh, Japan and South Korea, but in Hong Kong, Japan and South Korea and Taiwan, they were not seeing the same levels of uh, disaster. They were not seeing their hospitals overcrowded. They were people were were wearing masks, and uh, while at the same time, uh, in South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, people were wearing masks. The CDC and uh, the Surgeon General of the United States was coming out and saying, "Don't wear masks. We're, wearing masks is not effective unless magically you're a member of." Uh, of a of a of the healthcare system, so there was a lot of information, good and bad information coming out of governments, and governments were making all sorts of weird uh, um, attempts at actually um, promoting disinformation. And the reason they said the reason we have they said the uh, don't uh, don't use masks is that we're trying to preserve the masks for the healthcare workers. So they tell people don't uh, wear masks, but why not just be honest? And allow more people to make masks and uh, tell people you can make your own cloth masks and that'll stop or per, uh, slow down the prevention, etc. Instead of just mandatory shutdowns, etc. So, I can't help but think of the socioeconomic upheaval of a greenhouse earth would certainly interfere with the market's ability to operate efficiently. All sorts of uh, things get in the way of the market operating efficiently. Uh, but what is efficiency? Even after an earthquake, the market can operate efficiently with the understanding that the new level of efficiency is going to be lower than the previous level of efficiency. You just have to allow people to adapt to these new changes. 
And the issue is that there's uncertainty about what the future is by definition. There's uncertainty about the future and there's... Um, uh, there's lots of compelling reasons, economic reasons, not scientific, economic reasons why we're going to be richer in the future. And as we're richer in the future, we can deal with problems uh, uh, better with our higher incomes in the future. So my brother had to buy his own mask for the hospital because the private hospital wouldn't provide enough and asked them to reuse masks between patients. Why? Because they didn't want to have to buy more masks than they were. Market failure. So market failure isn't just any example of the market having an outcome that you don't personally like. There are specific definitions of market failure, and that is that uh, the cost, the, the marginal benefit of providing the efficient market output, uh, the marginal benefit is lower than the marginal cost under a free market. It's not obvious. If, if, uh, if doctors are providing their own masks, uh, then it's not obvious asking doctors to provide their own masks. How's that different from asking an employee to uh, to buy their own uniform at, at a fast food place? Uh, that happens a lot, um, just economically speaking. You also have the issue of, again, the, the healthcare system in the United States is not a free market. There were a lot of regulations regarding respirators, regarding mask usage, regarding what's allowed to be produced, who's allowed to buy, who's allowed to sell, in addition to all the governments um, uh, hectoring the, 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 uh, the businesses in order to uh, get them to change their production processes, etc. So there were a lot of market forces at play, but there were a lot of government forces counteracting the market at the same time. So it's not, it's not just a binary the market system is not just a binary private and uh, and and public, right? It's a spectrum. There's a there's a middle. There's more private, more government. So just because um, the the hospitals officially aren't owned by a government doesn't mean that they're fully private. They could be falling somewhere along the spectrum, and they could also be. Uh, burdened by a lot of particular regulations that uh, that in this particular instance are proving to be problematic. We are way over time. Okay, so this was uh, our last class. Um, Monday is going to be uh, uh, a rev uh, just a summary class of all the concepts that we covered throughout the semester. And then next Wednesday and next Friday, are uh, basically going to be review classes. I've got some of my own notes about what we're going to be reviewing. And um, it'll be also an open time to ask any questions you've had about the semester uh, regarding any of the contents about the semester. So uh, with that, uh, I will thank you guys for joining me and I will see you guys on Monday.